Um, all right. Thank you for tuning in to the Orchard Chronicles. Um, this is our third episode of our first season. Um, you may notice I'm in a new, well, new to you, the viewers environment. Um, I work in a lab at my school. Um, I think I've mentioned before, a lot of my work focuses on Lepidoptera. Um, I wanted to quickly put a disclaimer out there that, you know, I have my own things that I do, um, and I use the lab space for some of my tissue culture stuff, even though it's just for fun. Um, they're tolerant of it, mostly because, you know, I get my work done in there. It's not like I'm using school resources, I'm just using some of the space, and they allow me to, and everything like that. You know, it's not like space is um, really tight or anything. There are only two grad students in the lab right now. Um, but I just wanted to say that, um, one, if you're working in a lab, you should make sure you have permission before you start bringing your own stuff in. And also, um, you don't need lab equipment to do tissue culture. Um, it certainly facilitates some of the stuff. However, all of the materials that people use can be bought at Job Lot, Amazon, um, for those of you who aren't in New England, um, Kmart's and Big Lots and some of the other, you know, um, really inexpensive stores will s sell a lot of the supplies that you need. Um, just a quick, quick peek around the lab. Um, I have that bench. Um, I use the light there for some of my plant things. I have some Daytana caterpillars developing in there. Um, this isn't really a tour of the lab I work in, but I just wanted people to be aware that I um, do most of my tissue culture in here, although I will also do it at my house or my cottage or wherever. It kind of just depends on what's going on. Um, you can see I've made a whole bunch of media up over the past couple of days. Um, I made some new Superpedia media. I'll get to that in later episodes. Um, I don't want to focus this episode necessarily on a tissue t culture tour. Um, I want to focus this mostly on how do you go about... Oh, actually, first, let me just water these dandelions. I don't know why that particular section of cells got too dry. Um, I have Hapaloa climbing larvae that need some dandelion for the winter. Anyway, um... So there are a whole bunch of different options available. You can get a lot of these supplies on the internet. You don't have to use a lab, but um, in case people wanted to know, this is a pressure cooker. I'll unveil the glove box and everything at a later date. Um, today, I wanted to talk about a couple of things. One, the principles of tissue culturing and um, sort of what it's based in, how people go about doing it, how it pertains to orchids as well as how you can get started with your own tissue culture stuff and um, what you might need, what the difference between a um, defined and undefined media constituent are, and so on and so forth. So first of all, I want to talk a little bit about tissue culture, um, which is basically, very broadly, the usage of um, plant cellular material and specialty media to culture it. Um, Oh, can I switch the... Sorry about the pause. I was seeing if I could switch the view to my face. Um, not with this camera. Whatever. Uh, stupid Samsung. No, I'm kidding. Um, so, basically, tissue culture was developed sort of as a way to micropropagate large numbers of plants. Unlike animals whose cells commit to particular developmental fates, although you can tissue culture animal cells, um, tissue culture can be very good for um, efficient production of cellular material that you're using for study or lab work. When it comes to plants, you can take pretty much any plant cell, de-differentiate it, um, and then get it to grow and then make it become a whole new plant again and you can use a limited amount of space to produce a very large quantity of plants it does have its disadvantages but um people have been doing this for quite some time um tissue culture has um, a lot of applications these days um i'm not going to get too much into animal tissue culture for obvious reasons but um they are having an easier time tissue culturing animal cells now. There are extra steps you have to take to de-differentiate animal cells, or you can use stem cells that you've inserted DNA or influence the expression of genes of. Plants are a little bit simpler, but basically with plants, 
when you get your media and your plant material put into the media, the media has to have hormones and nutrients as well as energy so that the cellular material is kind of forced to become a clump of callous tissue or undifferentiated tissue that will then reproduce the organs that the fully mature plant has. Um, how does this pertain to orchids? Well, here's how. Plants ha usually produce a seed that has a material called endosperm. And endosperm is a, um, actually, can I just like, never mind. endosperm is a nutrient rich tissue, basically the yolk of a seed. And this is why you can take most seeds and throw them in soil or water or wherever they'll grow out of, and they'll automatically, or after some, you know, stimulation, you know, some need to be stratified or scarified, they will germinate out and the seedling will pop out of the dirt or wherever. Um, I'm being really general. There are plants that grow parasitically or plants that do things um, that produce endosperm, but they have a, another niche or place to grow out of. Um, but in general, you put a seed in the dirt and then it germinates and you have a seedling. Orchids don't put endosperm in their seed. So I'm going to draw a rough drawing of a, an orchid seed on the board. Um, again, I don't, don't take my, don't take this completely seriously. I have a vague idea and I'm going to be oversimplifying what this looks like. If you really want to know the exact terminology, anatomy, mechanics of all of this, please go seek additional resources. But anyway, so an orchid seed is basically this shell. Orchid seed is extremely tiny um, and then it has this very tiny embryo in it. Okay. That's really all that an orchid seed is. And there are some species that might have like an air bubble here. There are some species that may have a little bit of wax or something. But in general, with a few exceptions, orchid seeds lack endosperm and it's just this shell coating with an embryo inside. And in the wild, the orchid seed has to land on a suitable substrate, generally a symbiotic fungus. Okay, so we pretend that there's a fungus here. And when that happens, the orchid seed, um, usually moisture stimulates a tube to grow out. And if the orchid seed touches a fungus, the fungal hyphae, or basically the arm of the fungus, invades the seed. And the seed can start taking the material out of the fungus so that it can grow into a plant. And it doesn't happen that way. Orchids are monocots, and we'll talk about that in a second. Um, and that's usually what orchids require in order to um, develop. Um, you can substitute this for nutrient media. Um, orchid seeds will germinate, wherein the process of that little tube extending can happen with pure water. You'll take orchid seeds and if you moisten them, some percentage, up to half, will start to extend materials out of the seed looking for you know, fungus or nutrients or whatever, and obviously they will languish very quickly. They have done experiments where they've taken orchid seeds and after cleaning them, they've put them on media, some that contain just agar and water, some that have a little bit of starch, and, you know, some that are very deficient in other compounds, and they get to a certain stage of development, but then they die because they need other stuff for further development. Um, Usually when we talk about tissue culture, we want to define the orchid germination as the orchid becoming a protoquorm, which I'm going to get to in just a moment. But what you, all you need to know is that you can take nutrient media, and there are various medias out there for this type of thing. And some people just use organic material in maybe some fertilizer, and they've had some modest success with homemade medias. I'm going to talk about what I do in a moment, but... Um, you put the orchid seed in that, and it's able to extract the material from the media as if it were a piece of plant material from another group altogether living on tissue culture media. So that's how you tissue culture orchids, and that's why um, usually you think of um, tissue culture as for um, asexual plant reproduction. Um, Basically, you're putting orchid embryos on. People will also use um, tissue culture for embryo rescue of dicots. 
Um, by the way, the difference between monocots and dicots are if it's a monocot, you have a seed and it produces a single cotyledon, which is the first leaf and then it roots. If you have a dicot, you have a seed and then it produces the root and a double cotyledon. Um, orchids are classified as monocots, although orchids don't really produce a cotyledon so much as they produce a protoquorm, where basically you have the seed, you have the embryo inside, the embryo starts to take in material so that it can burst out of the seed, and then the whole thing becomes this big circular clump of undifferentiated cells called a protoquorm. And as time goes on, that protoquorm begins to develop photosynthase, so it turns green, and then it will eventually grow either roots or leaves. In epiphytes, it's usually the leaf first. In terrestrials, it's usually the root first. Um, and this obviously varies. So what people do is they take orchid seeds and they put them on special media. Um, the problem with tissue culture media is that tissue culture media is also very good at yielding development of bacteria, molds, and other fun fungi, and a variety of other things that you don't want growing. Um, so basically you're growing these orchid seeds aseptically and asymbiotically. Um, aseptically means that no microbes are allowed to get into the media, and asymbiotically means the orchid is not relying on a fungal symbiont to grow. By the way, there are some orchids that you can only grow if you have media that's promoting the mycorrhizal fungus or the symbiont that you then put the seed over. Um, that adds a whole other layer of complexity. Um, people are trying to work around some of these things. Um, what you'll find is that Cattleya and Phalaenopsis are um, the first orchids they've done a lot of tissue culture with, so there is a plethora of information out there about tissue culturing Phalaenopsis and Cattleya because those are the first ones they've done work with. Um, we now know how to tissue culture a huge number of orchids that probably wouldn't even be possible in the wild, such as different intergeneric hybrids, um, but that's beyond the scope of this video. Um, so it's very important to know what kinds of media you're working with. One place that I really, really like is a place on the internet called Phytotechnology Lab. Um, it's phytotechlab.com. Why isn't this? Um, very good place to go for a lot of materials. They have all of the um, medias you might need or want. They do have a variety of other products that aren't necessarily defined media per se. Their website has um, a lot of fact sheets, information about what ingredients are in the media and in what quantities how to store the media. They have what's called the Orchid Media Selection Guide where they have a chart of a variety of orchid genera and which medias people have used to tissue culture them. It's a really great resource. I recommend you use them. OSP or the Orchid Sea Bank Project is also a really good internet resource. I um, must say it's run by, um, I think his name is Aaron Hall or Aaron Hicks or something. His first name is Aaron. I don't remember what his last name was off the top of my head. Um, he has a whole lot of information. I will say I don't know if he's in the orchid seed stuff full time anymore. I did email him because I tried to order some dendrobium and cattleya seeds from his website a couple of months back, um, and the f online form was not working properly, and he just never got back to me. But I had bought media from him. I bought media from him about this time last year, so he does go in and out. I don't know. Um, he's in Arizona. I don't know if he's just busy with other stuff or if he just doesn't have um, as much available, but um, his website is still up and running and he has a lot of good information on there if you are looking for a good place to start, if you're looking for any ideas, inspirations, what have you. Um, so he also will sell media, he'll also sell supplies and he'll sell seed. Um, really good um, stuff out there. Anyway, um, Phytotech also will sell um, vessels for tissue culture and a few other things. You can honestly find tissue culture vessels for less money than at Phytotech. I'm not saying Phytotech is bad, it's just you can go on Amazon or go to Walmart and get mason jars or these hexagon jars. I like these better than the mason jars because the lid just twists on and off. I'm going to get to what's in here in just a moment. Um, the only thing is you would, before you open this, you have to um, wipe alcohol over this so that because the shelf will keep dust and contaminants that when you open this it'll vacuum it in and cause mold to grow. Um, there are also these. These are specifically meant, these are test tubes that are usually meant for tissue culturing stuff. What I find 
Um, and it's good because it leaves a little air gap. But what I normally will do is I'll jam some cotton in here before I pressure cook. Um, and I was just kind of testing out some other stuff. So why don't I just quickly go over some of the media stuff I have. Um, later on I can go into how to mix media up. Um, basically I have a variety of different media. I'll use P668 and 669. I'll use this um, Malmgren. I'll use K400. This is a really good media for a variety of epiphytes including Ketlea and their allies. Um, I have some other things in here that are for terrestrials and oncidiums. The O156, um, I think it's this thing. Oh, that's something else. That was for when I tried to teach a culture tulip tree. This is for um, Oncidium allies and things like that. But in any case, I have a variety of different medias. I store this in the fridge because the powder is uh, uh, hydroscopic, which means it will yank moisture out of the air. Coconut water is really good. It has a lot of different plant growth promotion factors. You can find this for like a dollar at Job Lot or any other store like that. I keep, I have to apologize in advance. I keep saying Job Lot. I know it's a New England thing, so this doesn't help if you're in New England. Um, and actually, if I could get people who are on the other side of the country to collaborate with me and say, okay, your Job Lot is our whatever, I would greatly appreciate that. Um, so anyway, coconut water is also really good. You don't want to have media that's the, the entire moisture content is coconut water, but if, you know, between a quarter and a third of the water you add the powder to is coconut water, that actually might help enhance germination. Um, I also made potato powder, pineapple powder, um, banana powder, things like that. I basically mashed up, well, I shredded this. I shredded these guys, the pineapple and the potato, in a food processor. I do a lot of baking, as I've mentioned. And then I just put a really flat layer on a tray in the, the drying oven for a lab. You can also do it in a regular home oven, I suppose. And I do the same for banana powder. I made this so that I, it's going to last better if it's dried and powdered. Um, Usually when people say add this much potato or this much banana or whatever, they mean the wet mass or the puree mass. Um, so if you know what the um, percentage of water is, it's a very easy conversion. You know, like potato, um, it's about 80% water. So if you needed a gram of wet potato, you multiply the one gram by 0.2, which is the percentage of dry mass, and so you need about 0.2 grams of the powder. Um, I think the powder is just easier to keep a hold of. Um, it's really up to you. I don't know if it makes that much of a difference one way or another. Anyway, that's sort of what I do. Um, it also is good to have agar or agaros on hand. Um, a lot of these premixes do have agar in them already. Some of them don't. Please, like this one doesn't. You have to add it yourself. Um, but this the packet doesn't explicitly say that. So please make sure when you buy any of these pre-made media, you look at the fact sheet associated with it, and they don't ship it with it. You have to go onto the internet, but get the fact sheet. You have to make sure there's a gelling agent, and you also have to make sure that you have a source of sugar, usually sucrose, which is table sugar, in case people didn't know, but you can also use glucose, um, and sometimes people will use honey, which is a conglomeration of a few different sugars. I have used honey before, um, and I get free honey from the farm I work with. Um, but you don't have to use honey, and make sure that if you are using honey, it is legit real bee honey. Some people say that there are antioxidants and good things in honey for tissue culture. That may or may not be true. It's really up to you if you want to use it. If you want to be simplistic, use um, sucrose. I'll usually add a little bit of both into it, only because adding a little bit of honey won't hurt, but you should also be careful not to rely only exclusively on honey. All right. So... Media, we've covered that to some degree. Um, if anybody wants elaboration on it, um, and it really just depends on what species you're working with. Um, I have to stop with the media talk to talk about sterility. It is incredibly important that anytime you're working with your media, that nothing enters this. Now, in big labs and such, they use what are called laminar flow hoods or sterile hoods, which are basically these, um, let me draw it out for you guys. You have, oh, I didn't cap the mark, good thing I came back over here. You have this hood 
and the person sits here and they stick their hands in here and usually there's like a shield here and they've cleaned this whole area out beforehand and behind them is a HEPA filter and it pushes air this way so that when you have stuff in the hood sterile air is flowing away from everything so this whole area stays sterile and as long as anything you put in is sprayed down with ethanol first everything in there should stay sterile now i personally i've used um laminar flow hoods on campus and you know things of that sort and pcr hoods I have a hard time using them. Um, I constructed a glove box, which is a more practical thing for home hobbyists and people that don't have access to these things. Um, be careful. If you're borrowing, if you're using somebody else's fume hood, I mean, laminar, you can't use a fume hood. You have to use a laminar flow hood. But if you're using a laminar flow hood out of school, remember that it may not be very well maintained you may not know how to check to make sure the filter is you know not worn down or old you don't necessarily know how to make sure that the um, fan is working efficiently you also have to be careful not to do too many sudden movements because that could create currents i just found it too much of a hassle to work with i like the glove box better because once you have everything in there and it's all sprayed from the inside that area is sealed and there's no way for any materials to enter from the outside world with a laminar flow hood you have materials entering entering the concept of the flow hood is the push of that sterile air is enough to keep things out but you have to have a good amount of practice. I generally have, I have found, get it, I have gotten far less contamination if I use my glove box. Um, and that's just me. I, you know, I get a lot of crap for the glove box just because it does reduce how much you can do at once. Um, but, you know, that's just something you have to play around with. What you really should do first, however, if you want to teach yourself how to do some of this stuff, you're going to need bleach and you're going to need alcohol. Um, you're going to need a pressure cooker or an autoclave. Um, pressure cookers are more accessible to people at home. The other good thing about pressure cookers is since they are meant for canning purposes, you're not subjecting your media components to as intense. It's intense enough to kill off microbes and spores and such, but it's not intense enough to destroy hormones, proteins, and other important vitamins and chemicals that might otherwise be destroyed in an autoclave and some tissue culture that is extremely sensitive will actually require specialty filtered solutions of vitamins added after autoclaving. That is beyond my realm. I study, you know, lepidopter biology, and, you know, quite frankly, it's a miracle that I can even um, do any kind of tissue culture because you do need a good amount of training in that area, and I kind of just taught myself a lot of this stuff. Um, I didn't well, I had a couple of people who kind of aided me in technique and stuff, but a lot of this I looked into myself and kind of just kept practicing at it. And so I just wanted to kind of teach you guys how you can go about doing that. Um, I would also like to thank the several people on campus who were also, um, who have done more tissue culture work than I have, who were, you know, more than willing to give me pointers, let me use their hood at one point, um, teach me a little bit of what they knew and stuff like that. Um, so, sterility is key. It doesn't matter where you store this. It matters when you have it open that no contaminants are around it. What people generally do is before you put this in a glove box or in a flow hood, you spray it down with ethanol. Um, isopropyl also works, but that basically will just kill everything. Generally what I find is that if it's still moistened with the ethanol when I have everything kind of set up, I don't have to worry too much. You don't want to spray with ethanol, leave it out of your hood or glove box for 10 minutes, and then put it into your glove or hood box and expect that it's still going to be sterile. But if, you know, you have to reach in and it's still wet with ethanol, the ethanol hasn't totally dried, you should be in the clear. Um, what I'll generally do is I'll spray it, I'll put it in and then it'll spray where my hands have been or just, you know, spray it again once it's in there. Um, I also make sure that I spray off the spray bottle of ethanol when everything's in there. 
so it does take some practicing. I make practice media. This is um, vegetable broth with agar added. It's not the strongest. Um, our agar is kind of old, so we may have to either order more or just use more per um, container. I've also been using agarose as a supplement to that um, because I'm a strict vegetarian. I don't usually go out and buy chicken broth or beef broth. Um, you can use those as well. Um, somebody did give me a container of chicken broth, and you know I didn't really go out and buy it, but um, I didn't say no, I can't take this. I did make some practice media with that as well. But um, this is veggie broth. That's what I usually go to the store and get to make practice broth and um, to make practice media because it's not as expensive as this stuff and you're not going to waste this stuff if you screw up. And so what you do is um, generally for every liter of liquid you want about 5 to 8 grams of agar. Um, I think I do about five or six grams of agar per liter, um, although I don't usually make an entire liter because a um, quarter liter gets you about seven of these. Well, maybe five or six if you're this thick. Um, in a later video, I'll talk about how thick you should make it. Um, this is kind of just the basics of how to get yourself started with tissue culturing. Um, you make your media, you put it through the pressure cooker. Basically, you put the lid on and you screw it slightly so it's secure, but so it's not tight, so that as the material in here really pushes up on the lid, it can be moving a little bit so you don't have this explode. Um, you put it through your pressure cooker, you allow the pressure cooker cycle to go, you know, maybe 25 minutes to a half hour, and then when it's done, you make sure that this gets closed up tight, and then just wait. A couple of days later, and what you can also do is make a set of media that you don't pressure cook, and then make a set of media that you pressure cook, and then you open it out in the air. And you'll see, if you open this right away, if you open this even for a split second and close it again, you'll have mold growing in it in several days to a week. Usually, after a week or two, it's obvious that it's been contaminated. You'll see mold and such. It actually might help if you sabotage some of your media vessels. Um, with practice media just so that you get an idea of what the contamination is going to look like and how long it's going to take to develop and things like that. And then once you've gotten down, okay, I've made the media successfully, I've pressure cooked it or autoclaved it so that it doesn't contaminate when it's in a sealed container. Now let me try opening it in a setting that will not promote contamination. Things that I've tried, do not try opening it um, in a container that's not completely sealed or a laminar flow hood. Those don't work. Also, do not try opening it over boiling water. That does not work either. Okay? You want it either in a glove box or a laminar flow hood. Make sure you, you know, practice wiping everything down. Practice wiping around the rim of the lid and everything. And then open it. Um, close it back up after a few minutes and then see what happens. Um, you know, do that with several. My glove box, when I made it, I was able to keep this thing open for, um, a couple hours and then I came back, closed it up and removed it and it didn't contaminate. Well, not this particular jar, but a jar like it. Um, then, practice, you know, take some tweezers in your setup. Dip them in ethanol or bleach water and, you know, clean it, open it, jab the media or, you know, practice dropping something that you've immersed in, you know, bleach or ethanol. Um, Bleach is good because it rinses cleanly. Um, however, you, you know, there is that risk of, okay, if you bleach something, you now have to worry about the potential for water to be contaminated that you're rinsing it away with. When I say it rinses cleanly, I mean it rinses without residue. Um, ethanol is good because not only does it kill dormant spores of stuff, it also just evaporates off on its own. Um, and it's, you know, less toxic and it doesn't leave residue if you don't rinse it completely. But, um, Either one is really good for keeping things sterile. When you see my glove box, I have both of them in there. But anyway, um, practice that sort of thing. And once you're confident that, yeah, you know how to make the media, you know how to get it free of contaminants and, you know, mess around with it, then you're ready to start making your real media. You want to follow the directions. Usually they come in these, like, one-liter pre-packs. I don't make an entire liter at once. I think it's safer to have the media unmade and stored in the fridge than it is to have jars. I usually don't want to make media more than about three months in advance um, just because, you know, I don't know how long it's going to last once I've added water to it. Even if it's in a sterile 
environments, things will eventually start to degrade in there. Um, so I usually make the media, you know, just a few weeks to a month or so before I need it or I think I'm going to need it. Because don't forget, too, those plants might stay on it for a good six months. Um, and as long as you keep your media in the fridge, uh, it should last quite some time. Um, so that's basically how to teach yourself tissue culture techniques. Um, there is a little bit more to it. The other thing to keep in mind when it comes to orchids is it's really a game of numbers. You're gonna, these medias don't generally yield 100% um, anything. There are medias that you put the seeds on and a huge number grow, but they don't make it past the protocorm stage. And then there are other medias where a few grow, but they all make it to seedlings that you can deflask. Um, and, you know, you can't expect every last seed from a seed pot of tens of thousands to germinate when you put them on something. And basically the goal of this tissue culture endeavor is you have all this material and you're hoping to get at least something out of it. And, you know, you optimize the media as best you can with different chemicals, organic and inorganic. Um, you have defined media constituents such as calcium, nitrate, and things like that. And then, you know, your pineapple powder and your potato powder, coconut water, those are considered undefined because there's not really a chemical formula for them. They're, you know, a mix, a variable mix at that of chemicals. Um, but then again, so is a fungal cell or, you know, symbiont. So it's not that big of a deal. But just keep in mind that the whole game of tissue culture is not 100% yield. Nothing in biology is, honestly, but you start off with a whole lot of seeds. Some portion of those will successfully germinate and some portion of those will successfully become mature plants. And you start off with enough seeds that if the media is somewhat decent, you'll wind up with dozens, if not hundreds of, you know, baby seedlings that you can then grow out of flask um, and develop into orchid plants. So that's kind of just my introductory tissue culture thing. Next time I talk about tissue culture on the next episode, I will talk specifically about um, how to make orchid media itself and how to watch for contaminants, what you need to do with different orchid species, how to um, clean seeds and get them onto the media and things like that. Um, so stay tuned. Thank you for watching. And again, thank you to anybody who has um, done anything to help me out. Um, thank you to the people um, like Larry here at URI who um, helped me obtain some of these things and, you know, Andrew Carey, who um, was very helpful in um, just some of my technique and, you know, Brian, who's one of the plant people telling me, you know, what kinds of information I might need to know and where to find resources for this sort of stuff. Um, it's really great that I've been around all you guys to make sure that, you know, even though this isn't something I'm pursuing as a career, they were still willing to kind of just say, hey, you're having fun doing this. And so I'm hoping to kind of just um, pay it forward and see, okay, if anybody out there wants help with teaching themselves or I, I, learning this type of thing, then um, I'm going to make sure that people have some more information out there to the best of my abilities. Of course, I'm not in a position to do controlled experiments with all of this stuff. This is kind of a couple of seed pods that I have lying around that I'm messing around with.